Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the TIFF Industry Conference and all of the love in Canadian cinema. My name is Melissa D'Agostino. I'm the associate producer here at the conference, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this afternoon's session. Um, RDV Tokenizing the Film Industry is part of our RDV Canada panel series, which is supported by Telephone Canada. And we at TIFF are thrilled to be working again with our long-term partners, Telephone Canada, on this exciting session and all of the panel sessions in that program. I wanted to remind you that uh, there is absolutely no photography or video uh, recording inside the studio during this session. However, not to worry, because we are live streaming this talk in the conference, the entire conference, to our website and our YouTube channel. So hello to our audience tuning in. Please feel free to share it and comment and let us know your thoughts as the panel goes on. And please do tweet about the panels. Um, you can do that using the hashtag TIFF. 18 for the festival. Um, I'd like to start the proceedings by welcoming someone to the stage who's going to say a few words before we get the discussion going. So without further ado, I would like to welcome onto the stage the Executive Director of Telephone Canada, Krista Dickinson. Please welcome her. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Bonjour, mesdames et messieurs. Uh, welcome to Rendezvous Canada panel, tokenizing the film industry, which is actually the first of three panels this year at TIFF on blockchain. So really quite exciting. I'm Krista Dickinson, and I'm the new executive director of Telefilm Canada. Canada has always been at the center of global innovation, from the very first IMAX screen all the way to artificial intelligence. And at Telefilm, we are excited by the t potential that we see in technology, as well as new business models for tomorrow. Telefilm fosters innovation and works to strengthen the position of Canadian talent in the marketplace as well as across the globe. Exploring new ways to conduct business as well as empowering our industry with new tools to perform better. Finding ways to reach more audiences and sourcing ways to better protect our intellectual property. These are conversations and explorations that we stand absolutely behind, and we find them absolutely crucial at this intersection in our society. This is why we have partnered with the Canada Media Fund on a new research initiative to look at how blockchain can actually be leveraged by the Canadian television, film, and digital media industries. The Canada Media Fund is an absolutely perfect partner for this research as they already are supporting blockchain initiatives through their dynamic experimental fund, experimental stream fund. So thank you to our CMF partners who are with us here in the room today for our, your continued collaboration. The results of this joint study are not quite available, but they will be re released very soon, so do stay tuned. But now, let's listen, let's learn together about the new emerging technology, and I'd like to ask Leora Cornfield to come up on up, and she'll be moderating this panel for us. Thank you very much. Hello and welcome, everybody. It's great to see people here today. Um, I'm guessing this is a crowd full of decentralization enthusiasts and decentralization curious, which is the way we want it. That al always brings about the best uh, conversation, the best questions. Uh, my name is Leora Kornfeld, and I'm honored to be here today to moderate this panel. We have three guests here uh, with varying degrees of jet lag, so I'd like to bring them out now. Um, producer J.D. Serafin, who just got off a plane from uh, London. There he is. Come on out. <laughs> and uh, he's Los Angeles-based. We have um, Zach Skeeth of the Toronto R&D studio, Three Lefts. And finally, Manuel Badel of Badel Media, who is a consultant and who will uh, tell us about the research project. 
so great to see everyone. Uh, could I just get each of you to do sort of like the book flap version of who you are and why you get to sit on this stage with us today? So we'll start with you. Um, <laughs> that's a good reason. Why do I get to sit up here? <laughs> I'm grateful to be here. Uh, right now, I'm a producer entrepreneur, uh, funded a number of entertainment uh, slates as well as independent films. Right now, my production company is producing the Atari movie. Uh, with Leonardo DiCaprio and Appian Way, and we're funding it with the issuance of a security token. So we spent the last year deeply exploring the best way to do that. So I'm here to share you know, my knowledge, insight, and experience in, in what we're doing with that project. Great, we'll get to that. And Zach? Um, hi, um, I'm from Three Lefts. We're a about 11 person uh, consulting and venture firm around uh, enterprise blockchain solutions. And we partnered with the Group Media TFO to build the first um, middle to end blockchain solution for the media industry um, earlier this year. And this is my third panel and event with Telefilm. We were, first, we were in Berlin at the Berlin Alley, and then we were at South by Southwest, and now we're home in here in Toronto. So we are excited to be here. And oh, you got some serious blockchain frequent flyer points. Yeah, yeah exactly. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's good to hear. And, Manuel. and we can track that. I own it too, so it's good. Uh, okay. <laughs> Manuel. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so my name is Manuel Badel. I'm from. Uh, I'm based in Montreal. I'm a consultant in digital media, specializing myself in um, digital media project financing and uh, business models. I've used to to work at Telefilm for ten years and uh, the CMF and. Uh, at uh, SODEC, which is the equivalent of uh, OMBC in Quebec. Uh, two years and a half ago, um, I was in South by Southwest attending uh, uh, a conference we, which was uh, entitled uh, Blockchain, the Next Revolution. So I was, uh, I was uh, interested in attending the, this conference and it was really a revolution for me. You know, I've, since uh, that date, I started to, to integrate blockchain, uh, blockchain approaches and, uh, and, uh, and started to develop skills and, uh, and a strong interest in, on how blockchain technologies could be applied to the media industry. So I've worked with Telefilm on different uh, events such as uh, in Berlin and uh, in South by Southwest here today. And uh, very happy to, to share with you uh, different uh, concerns re related to the subject. And you helmed the research report that uh, Yeah, I'm working on the research, uh, which is, uh, Krista talk, talked about uh, this research uh, a few minutes ago, a research on uh, how blockchain could have impact uh, on, the, on the media industry, uh, on film, TV, gaming industries, uh, especially in, in the Canadian context. Great. So as you can see, we're dealing with blockchain in a very concrete way today. I know... If you're here, you're, you probably know a few things about blockchain already, which is great, because we really don't want to do a blockchain 101. We don't want to do a philosophical, abstract discussion of decentralization. We want to talk specifically about projects that are in progress, uh, pain points that they have addressed. Um, but also, we want to take a balanced view, because uh, Blockchain is very hyped, but it's also very hated. And I can tell you this, I know this personally. I recently wrote uh, an article about blockchain and how it can radically or potentially radically bring down production costs in, uh, in uh, the production industry. And there was a, an international group of people who have already been um, experimenting with blockchain and they were throwing a lot of uh, digital darts at me and saying, there still is centralization involved, even though there's a lot of talk about decentralization. And I think what's important to realize is that blockchain is at now where the consumer internet was around 25 years ago, for those who remember that, where we didn't quite know what it was good for, but there was the sense that it was going to change the world. Nobody just really knew exactly how. So consider all of yourselves blockchain pioneers here because here you are in 2018 and much is unknown and we're going to get into um, some of the hopes, the promises, but also you know some perils and pitfalls. Um, Manuel, I want to start with uh, some of the slides. We're going to talk specifically about tokenization, which is a word that's in the title of our panel. This idea of what tokenization is for the industry. So if you could just walk us through these slides. Yeah, yeah absolutely. We, we've prepared some slides because uh, the blockchains can be a 
sometimes complicated to, to understand, and uh, uh, some people mm, are starting to, to, to know very well the, the, this, uh, this, uh, this technology, but some others are very newbies. So, so we just wanted to, to introduce the, 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 the topic and, uh, and, uh, and talk about tokenization, because tokenization is part of the blockchain world, in fact. In fact, um, ju just to remind you or to, 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 to tell you that blockchain, in fact, just uh, so some key, key fundamentals regarding the technology, blockchain uh, is made of blocks and chains, <laughs> as we were saying. <laughs> so <laughs> blockchain is a, is a DLT technology, which, which is a, a distributed, distributed ledger technology. Uh, it's a peer-to-peer -peer network, such as Napster was uh, uh, 20 years ago, or BitTorrent can be. Uh, so um, th there, there is, what is important to understand is that there is no central authority, there, there is no central database, it's distributed. The, the information is distributed on, on the network. Uh, what can you do with blockchain? In fact, with blockchain, you can transact transact, uh, transfer uh, a value, uh, a currency, such as Bitcoin. You know, Bitcoin was the, the first, uh, the first um, uh, business application, application of, yeah. uh, of blockchain technologies. And uh, you can, uh, you can um, uh, record, uh, you can uh, record uh, transactions, in fact. And so uh, blockchain is, is, is a ledger, so you, you can track, you can track transactions. And you can um, you can find new utilities, uh, new m business models. In fact, through what we call smart contracts. Smart contracts are in fact automated um, automated agreements uh, that reflect uh, business rules, uh, b industry practices. So smart contracts helps. In, helps in terms of uh, efficiency. Uh, and uh, so these are different concepts that are very, very important to, to, to understand uh, when we talk about blockchain. And um, um, so tokenization. So I was talking about smart contract. Tokens are kind of extension of, of, uh, of smart contracts. Smart contracts. So tokens, uh, a token is a digital asset. Uh, as it is uh, <laughs> uh, written on this slide, it's, it's a dis digital asset, and uh, through tokenization, you are able to give a, a, a value um, through this token to a, 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 an asset which can be a project, for, for instance, a film project. You can okay. chop it up into little pieces, basically, exactly. that have a representation in a digital you, form. And so you can have yeah, a small pieces of an asset, which which can be, uh, as I it was saying, it could be real estate. It could be real estate. It could be could be a, a, a painting, for painting, instance. Painting, real estate, it could a, be movie. a film. Yeah. Could be a, could be a different. Uh, you know, there, there are a lot of applications of blockchain in different industries. So, token is a is a digital asset, and uh, tokenization. So it's the act of convert converting an asset. And it's it's a, it's a way of digitizing. Uh, an asset which can be physical. You know, at the very beginning of a, well, not at the very beginning, in fact, internet is about information. Uh, with internet, we've been able to, to digitize um, uh, information, communication, so now we are able to digitize assets and so value. Let's take a look at the next. Uh, so you, yeah, for the next, uh, next slide, you, you have different kinds of, di oh, different kinds of tokens. Uh, the previous there it yeah. is. and uh, with uh, JD, we were going to talk about the different kinds of uh, of, uh, of, uh, of tokens. So very quickly, you have, in fact, when you have a token, you have a utility which is which is related to this token. In, uh, you you are creating features, functionalities, and so a value related to the token itself and uh, the re and uh, the and the asset and the project itself. So uh, you can have a utility token. Transaction token are a way of, um, as it is said, uh, you can convert, in fact, tokens in other uh, cryptocurrencies, other tokens, so you can exchange. Uh, tokens are supposed to be liquid, and you can you can uh, you can uh, you can use them in order to 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 create value and uh, to um, well to create value, in fact. And so you have security token, which. 
uh, which may be the more uh, <laughs> more. <laughs> Uh, JD the, can go into detail yeah, yeah. about we this. We have some issues with, with security tokens because yes. security tokens are considered as uh, as uh, investments in a way. Uh, there are titles. So when you, you 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 when you have a utility token, it can be used uh, for different usages. But a security token is more considered as uh, an investment, which can be more complicated with the regulator. In fact. Right, and I think something else that we need to establish is that one of, the, one of the big promises of blockchain is that these exchanges of value can happen without a third party or central authority. And the idea is that this blockchain system where things are registered and immutable, which means once they're there, they can't be taken down, that's where the records are stored. So the idea is, in its pure form, that these these value exchanges can be done without intermediaries, and for these reasons, there are potentially huge uh, reductions in um, costs and time and all sorts of efficiencies. I mean, that's what people are hoping for. And so uh, this is a curve the, that represents uh, the evolution of ICOs. ICOs are initial coin offerings. In a way, it's, the, it's, it's a way of of attracting investors to finance a project and then tokenize uh, this project because when you invest in project, you get tokens and these tokens have, have value and can be utilities or securities. So the, you know, the Singular DTV, which is a, a, an American company, which is, I don't know if some people of Singular are here, but they are one of the, uh, of the, um, the, the leaders in this industry. They, they started to, 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 be, to, to develop the different tools for the, for the media industry. Um, so the, it's very recent, you know, three years ago. Um, one of the uh, very interesting Canadian uh, project or platform, in fact, is CryptoKitties. CryptoKitties is... It, Has anybody heard of CryptoKitties? It's the biggest the, the, game on the blockchain. Yeah, yeah. it's <laughs> incredible. It's a company based out of Vancouver that started it, and uh, people are paying up to six figures for digital yeah, cats. Absolutely. I think that the, yeah, <laughs> the, the highest sold was uh, 140000 for uh, a unique kitty, in fact. So yeah. to, we that's are, how the internet <laughs> starts. That's how everything starts. That's so a lot of money, you know. Now, but uh, very strange. Uh, we'll see how, the, how this, uh, this platform evolves in the, in the next uh, few months and few years. Because, uh, uh, but that's, that is very, very interesting. And, uh, and uh, they created, uh, in fact, what is feasible with, with blockchain technologies. And I don't want to be too technical, but they, they created the... Um, 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 Collectibles, in fact. Uh, so, so collectibles are unique assets. One of a kind digital assets. Yeah. And, and that's uh, why some people are willing to pay six figures for them. Exactly. So. And this is the way they, 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 they create value. And so now we, 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 we have different uh, examples of, uh, of, uh, of uh, film and TV projects that are, that are being uh, based on blockchain solutions. One of them is the, yeah. the Atari Well, on the biopic. right of the curve there, we see a reference to Atari, yeah. which brings us to JD. You can tell us all about the project that you're doing. Um, you're out there. You've got to be one of the first people to be financing a film this way. Is that right? Yeah, there's been a, a few small projects that have done it. I think we're the largest film to date that's that's blazing a trail up this mountain. Uh, you say that with a nervous smile, <laughs> well, too. I like that. Because <laughs> I stepped out. I, we, when we, a year ago, decided we were going to go down this path, it was really driven by the desire to have uh, the community, you know, the Atari gaming fans, gamers around the world, have the opportunity to invest in the movie. Because from my perspective, and I've had some experience with crowdfunding in the past and having that same community that was invested in the movie helped drive the marketing of the film in a, a dynamic and, and whole new way. But I wanted to take it to the next level and say, you know, don't just pre-buy the movie, but can they actually own a piece of the film? So we were looking at equity crowdfunding. It lacked like certain dynamic qualities uh, that we were looking for. And this is right around the time that ICOs really took off. And so, you know, that brought me down the rabbit hole of looking at crypto and blockchain and you know, we decided early on to do a security token and then also to develop some 
you know, some other things to help drive the marketing around utility tokens and stuff. So, so what is the big difference between equity crowdfunding, where you own a stake, and what you're doing with the Atari movie? Well, I think really the main difference is the using distributed ledger technology or the tokenization of that, ac that asset or that share. So really all we're doing in terms of the finance structure, just to simplify it for producers or investors in the room, is we're selling shares in a corporation that are then being digitized and then put on a public blockchain, on the Ethereum blockchain, so that depending on an investor's jurisdiction, once they're, once they're eligible, they can resell that in a liquid secondary market. So there's a number of security token exchanges that are in the process of being built, getting licenses, going live, T0, Open Finance Network, Hyperion. So one big advantage for a producer and for financiers is the opportunity to not just invest in a movie early and have your money locked up for 18 to 24 months, but to create liquidity at a much earlier stage so that if you buy into a project, say, at 10 cents per share, whatever that, you know, that unit is, and because after the fact, you know, the, the film attaches a big star or locks a big distribution deal or et cetera, et cetera, the value of that unit could go up. And you as an investor who came in early could realize the value of, you know, the risk that you took on by investing early. So I think there's the advantages of liquidity. There's the advantages of accountability and transparency. So, you know, I, everybody talks about movie accounting like it's notoriously shady. I mean, I think there are people that um, do behave badly, but I think a lot of times it's just inefficiencies in the process. And I think there's other companies in the space, you know, uh, that are focused on developing blockchain-based solutions that will help to root out some of those inefficiencies. So I think that accountability and transparency, so for us having investors have the ability to, you know, see when there's a d distribution to the collection account and see that the token holders all received X amount of what they were supposed to receive. So, and then off after that, it's really the biggest value is having a community built around the film that can ultimately help to drive the film success. So those were the factors that drove us down the path of basically creating a, a security token offering or an STO is what okay, they call it. Okay, so if I was bold enough to say, I want to invest in your movie, would I be allowed to? You have to have accredited investors or how does that work? You've got different types of investors, right? Well, it depends where, where are you from? <laughs> <laughs> so it, it's, it's right now in the US, we're using Reg D 506C what for accre accredited investors okay. to invest. Uh, Reg S for overseas or international investors, non-US investors. That would be me, and, okay. And then Reg CF for uh, up to a million dollars in unaccredited investors. So, and that and th that portion of the round will actually happen in what they call a crowd sale in in terms of ICO terms. So we're in a private sale right now, and most of the funding is being raised through a private sale. Um, but we we're going to utilize the public pre-sale and the crowd sale as a way to really begin to build the marketing momentum around the movie and build a community around it, which is really, I think, the biggest benefit. Because already you can, you know, you can raise financing in a variety of techniques, but, and there are some advantages to using blockchain as it relates to a security token, but to me, the biggest advantage is getting a community invested in the movie that will help to really drive it to make it a success. Okay, now, Zach, this brings us over to you, because as far as I know, there is no country in the world that has figured out, like, the He's going, no, they haven't, the legal and governance issues. Because, for example, if I own a digital token for a piece of real estate, I know this is happening somewhere, this is one example, and I own the digital token, but I don't own the piece of real estate, right? So there's a difference. So can you just tell us about where things are going with legal and governance issues and ways that investors <coughs> can be protected? That's a great question, and I think a great example is I'm not going to name a name, but it's very easy to find online that there is a very large, one of the largest ICOs a couple years ago raised between 200 and 300 million dollars that are currently facing a class action lawsuit because the way that they set it up is they used a, a non-profit foundation that everyone who was buying access to their network and to their organization was basically giving a donation and now they're trying to figure out what's going on and no one can get their money back. And the OS Was it designed that way, you think? Was it meant to be a scam? I don't want to be held liable don't, for okay. any defamation <laughs> or anything. So you guys can... I'll take that as a yes. You're all criti <laughs> critical thinkers, so you can... Um, but I think a really interesting conversation is around, you know, there's a very strong understanding from the growth of the cryptocurrency market from the beginning and where the 
culture grew from. And you understand the, the place of where cryptocurrencies decentralization came from. It came from a lot around the cyberpunks of the, the 90s, the, the anti-establishment viewpoints, and that's where a lot of this has grown from and, and, and really built from that. And so when you have the regulators like the OSC and um, the bigger CSA, the SEC, who are coming in, more than just trying to protect investors, you're now turning to this might be a fundamental challenge to the view in which we understand what this community could be and should be. So that's a huge issue that we're, we're trying to solve as a community, just in general, um, around the blockchain space, because where the hype is right now. Everyone wants to figure out where they can make their money and, and work. OSC has been very reluctant at the moment, as well with most countries. And um, that's the, the Ontario Security Securities, Securities Commission, Commission. Yeah, yeah. in the province to understand. So what are these tokens, the difference between security and utility and all these different tokens, where they come from, what they mean. They do have the, the, the Huey test, the Howey test, about what is an investment. Um, am I investing in it for use, like a movie ticket or a pizza coupon that I can go exchange for the pizza? Or am I investing in it hoping that you know, they might be able to secure a big distribution deal and the value goes up, and so I'm investing, maybe diversifying my portfolio. It's still very early on, as you said at the beginning, about where we're sitting in this, in this um, sort of ideological battle around decentralization and blockchain, that precedents and all that don't really want to be set right now because we don't know where the, everything's going. So right now, it's a lot of gray area. And to understand is really on an individual project by project basis to understand like the Atari of going through the securities to go through and to get make sure that at least there's regulation behind it that they can sit and where investors are protected because at the at the core that's what everyone even the government that's what they want no matter where you really view the government it's to protect the investors that if I put in all this money that there's somehow you know prospectus anything like that that the value of what I'm investing in is not just going to be taken and just run with. Yeah, and um, if something goes wrong, that you have the ability to sue somebody. Yeah, that's really that what someone it's about. can be held yeah. accountable for yeah. something. So that's really where the legal space is right now around tokenization. I mean, tokenization isn't new. Tokenization, encryption, idea of taking data and um, changing it to a large number that can be held, has been around since credit cards and, and for a long time. But how the change between on-chain versus off-chain of holding some sort of asset. Can you say a bit more about on-chain versus off-chain? Well, that's important. It's basically exactly what you said around I own a house or I now own $25 of a million dollar house. If it gets sold for one point or two million, do, how do I know that what's off the chain, which is who held the, the, the deed to the house versus what's on the chain and that value? Um, there's still conversations about how that is legally going to work. What's the legality of, of smart contracts and, and agreements between individuals on a regulatory side? That, you know, is still kind of up in the air and seeing where we can go from there. Right. Now, Manuel, in the course of the research project that uh, you've been doing, you've been looking at applications, keeping the Canadian industry in mind and how the media industry can benefit from blockchain. We've, we've heard a bit about the possibilities, we've heard about some of the perils. So what can you tell us about what you've found in your research about um, areas that, that, um, that we think can, can offer producers actual benefits? Well, um, um, well, the research will be published soon, in yes, October, <laughs> so more details. Don't give uh, away too much, <laughs> just a little, yeah. like a trailer. Yeah, uh, well, in fact, um, we've identified two families of applications and six applications. In a way. The first one, the first family is about uh, right management, and the other one is about uh, business models, and particularly new business model, well, what we're talking about right now, and we, with this kind of example, this kind of project, this is this is typically what we're talking in the in the research. Uh, the first family, the right management. You know, blockchain could have um, could could have positive impacts in terms of IP protection, uh, intellectual, intellectual property pro protection, uh, digital right management, of course. And also collaboration, you know. Uh, collaboration, 
I was talking about the, the, the first, uh, the first um, uh, workshop or conference I attended a few years ago, and it was about uh, how blockchain, it was about a solution um, that was uh, uh, improving how different script writers could collaborate on the same script and how contribu contribution of each other could be, could be tracked in a way, mm -hmm. and then uh, recognition could could be could be uh, could be a consistent with consistent with uh, all the, these contributions. So, so in a way, when I'm talking about co uh, collaboration, it could be very interesting in terms of uh, co-productions. Uh, for instance, when you have different teams from different countries that have to, to collaborate and work on, on the same project, uh, people that that are maybe not used to, to work together, but, but this could be very interesting because you can track e each contribution. You, you can add um, uh, permissions to, 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 you can have uh, nodes, in fact, people uh, on, on the network that could validate and authorize the, the different, uh, different task or different decision. And uh, it could be very interesting too in, when, when, you, when you have um, transmedia productions. So for instance, you, you produce something on TV and you have, you have uh, the, the digital component which is related to, to, this, uh, to this production. The other, the other aspect which is more related to the uh, Atari biopic is, uh, is the, 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 the way uh, you can, um, um, when I'm talking about new business models, uh, Blockchain is about disintermediation. In fact, you can transact and, and transfer to, 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 uh, from A to B without uh, an intermediary. Uh, this doesn't mean that distributor will disappear, or, but roles can change. The you roles know? are changing. That's yeah. the thing that I got attacked about when I wrote that article, is people were yeah. saying there's just new intermediaries that enter the picture. Exactly. Yeah. We, we don't know exactly uh, for now, but uh, it, it will change for sure. So if there is a disintermediation, there is a potential for uh, creators to, to, to directly sell, uh, distribute their, their, their creation. I think that the, the question of the, the promotion, the marketing is not resolved. It could be through tokenization, you know, but it's another part. I think that blockchain is more about transactions than marketing for now. Uh, the other, the other um, uh, business, new, new, new business application that, that I see in the second family uh, are, um, uh, so I was talking about uh, content distribution, um, financing, of course, through to tokenization and monetization of content, okay, through cryptocurrencies or fiat currency. And uh, the third one in this family is about, and which is, I think, one of the most inter interesting in, in, the sh in the short term perspective and which is related to digital right management is how you can improve royalty payments and uh, investment recruitment, which can be very interesting for uh, funding agencies such as Telefilm Canada, the CMF and other uh, provincial uh, agencies. Or, and this is very interesting because you can track this is, I think, in, in the <laughs> research, the very uh, yes. when we've talked with, with stakeholders in the industry, the potential of traceability of blockchain is maybe cent is central and maybe the most interesting in the very short term because you can track how uh, content ca are, are, are sold and then you can track revenue, etc. So um, Right. There's a famous, there's a big lawsuit going on right now that some of you may have heard of that the band Spinal Tap, a favorite of all of us, I'm sure, they were told that their revenues between 1998 and 2016 were $81. Mm -hmm. That's <laughs> what they were told. So I'm guessing that if we had blockchain, maybe that wouldn't have happened, but now they're doing a major lawsuit around that. And just to, to add regarding yes. this, uh, this uh, recoupment of investment or you know, this tracking, because you, you can track sales, but uh, also in real time. Normally you sh should be able to do this in real time, which right. is very interesting because you know, it can be long before uh, all the, the stakeholders, all the, the, all the people that have been involved in the production get their money back or their or they found out that somebody yeah. else took their money. <laughs> yeah, I mean, in, in the traditional, <laughs> thank you for that, in, in the traditional systems. Uh, Zach, your company developed uh, a prototype mm -hmm. for a broadcaster. Can you tell us about what uh, the objectives of that were, blockchain-based prototype? Yeah, definitely. So uh, the broadcaster that we're working with, 
is, a, was a, is the Ontario French uh, public channel, the TFO, and they have a lot of export of their content to uh, France and, and part of French-speaking um, Africa, and Louisiana is a huge area. And being able to track where your content is being distributed and where you can see that if I know that m I am giving my license to JD here, that he can distribute to France, but then he goes to another distributor and goes for, let's say, just for, of Paris, that I don't have to know that relationship, but with the tech of the blockchain, I know that no matter what, who you talk to in France or anywhere in France, that you cannot be licensing it to anyone outside of France based on the rules that I have governed based on our original contract, because every contract talks down the chain. So if it's distributed 10 times, 15 times, 20 times, it might get lost in the current system and not quite sure where it's being played. Uh, even in uh, Berlin, we had the same conversation where filmmakers come to us and said, distributors would come to us, my film has being, was out in the world for two years and they came back and said it was never played once. And I couldn't fight whether or not it was there, I was too small and I don't have a big enough legal team to try to fight it. So how can I use this technology to you know, get uh, better contracts um, compliance contracts with distributors that I know every time it's getting played, and then I can pay every, all the actors, whoever gets points on, on profits or whatever, uh, instantaneously based on the, the, the numbers that I have. So that was a big aspect of it that they were really trying to try to push. And then second had to do with the royalty payments on just being able to make sure that every person based on their contract um, was getting paid uh, on time and with being and with the being what, when it's being watched and on what platform based on their contract, uh, whoever is part of the film. So Spinal Tap really could have used you. I a think few so. Years ago. They really. <laughs> so could have if used you're watching, you. how technical does a, a company need to be, a production company, to start going down this road to to get into these types of applications? I mean, it really depends if you want to. If you want to take it yourself and go and build your own underlying blockchain, build your use case and go forward. Uh, overall, access to cloud, the internet, <laughs> and some cloud computing, and just being able to at least have every person in your network having access to internet at the very core is all that's really needed. You don't need to go and hire massive blockchain developers to do it. Um, right off the bat, A, because there's a shortage of them and they're quite expensive. Um, and there's a lot of companies out there that are working in this space that have uh, enterprise-based, and it's basically just a large supply chain, really, um, of what the, the film system is. And so working and understanding the supply chain and access to that is really all you need at this point. And to hire you, I'm guessing. Uh, and you can hire us. Yeah, sure. <laughs> or not. Is yeah. Well. Um, JD, I wanted world. to talk to you because you, you're, of, of all of us here, you're the one who's really had his hands dirty in this. So in terms of, uh, tell us about what your total budget is and where you're at with the, the raise right now. Like where are you at with the financing and how that's all coming together? Well, yeah, and just to kind of continue the point of what uh, Zach was saying, I think there's actually a number of great companies and entrepreneurs that are building platforms to help make this user-friendly and accessible for filmmakers. I mean, the main promise of doing this is so that independent filmmakers can be empowered to, you know, find financing support, you know, build new systems that will help power, you know, every element of film production and distribution in a whole new way. And I know, um, you know, Zach's company at Three Lefts and Featurely is doing some awesome mm -hmm. stuff. I know Singular DTV is doing some awesome stuff. MovieCoin, another Toronto-based company called Slate. There's actually a lot of them in Canada, I feel like. So uh, there's a lot of companies, actually, that filmmakers can go and look at and talk to if they're interested in exploring how this could, you know, help uh, power what they're trying to do with their movies. Now, in terms of our film, the production budget's about $40 million. Um, we're about $10 million of that is soft money. So we're obviously still going to monetize that in a very traditional way. Uh, we're doing a, a blended structure, so we're actually raising up to $50 million through the token sale. And the reason we're doing that is we wanted to co-finance the PNA so that for token holders, we could create a 50% adjusted gross receipts corridor so that token holders aren't waiting at the bottom of the waterfall to get paid. They're getting paid from dollar one adjusted gross right at the top of the waterfall. So that's something that 
you know, based on my experience with film finance, I wanted to do that so that one of the first big films that uses this approach was on some level successful for, for people who were buying these tokens or who were investing. So that's basically the, the general structure. It's very simple, it's very straightforward and very transparent, so. And what are you hearing from investors? Well, generally we hear yes and we hear a lot of excitement, which is good, but um, we're, we're kind of focused in a few different areas. We're focused on people who are already in the space and companies that we're talking to that, you know, understand the movie business and understand what's novel or different about how we're approaching uh, what we're doing with this film. And then we're also talking to a lot of, you know, larger investors in the cryptocurrency space. So uh, entrepreneurs, guys who have been very successful in the last two, three years, who are interested in diversifying into like a security token or getting into the movie business. And so I think for filmmakers to look at that too, or producers that there is a new pool of investors, you know, in the cryptocurrency space. And these are people who have built up <clears throat> asset bases that would be interested to invest it in diverse ways, you know, and I think everyone loves movies, everybody loves entertainment, so I think the opportunity for investors in the cryptocurrency space to invest in movies is, you know, is a no-brainer, so. Let's um, open it up to questions. We've got about 15 minutes, and I bet there's lots of questions. I saw a hand over there, and a nice person in an orange shirt is coming to you. What options uh, are available to, uh, as far as distribution on the blockchain for independent filmmakers right now? There's a, there's a few. There's, uh, there's Slate, there's Singular DTV. Um, there's a few companies that are developing platforms. They're relatively new. Um, what we're doing with our film is we're kind of combining traditional, a traditional approach to distribution with non-traditional ideas and everywhere that we can, we're trying to incorporate new techniques or new companies. Um, but there's, you know, it's still pretty early to be honest. Like I think that the companies who are building like blockchain based distribution platforms, I think they have a lot of great ideas. I think it's a very challenging hill that they're climbing, um, especially ones that are like, we're gonna be Netflix on the blockchain. It's like, well, Netflix is spending, you know, $8 billion a year and there's so much content that they have. and. Um, so for users, you know, the value proposition of pay $10 a month and get access to that library versus what, you know, the, some of the newer platforms has is different. So there's, there's also one called Alpha Networks, which is exciting, which is using uh, IBM Watson uh, to power uh, a dynamic pricing model. So like if you're in Finland or if you're in the U.S. or you're in Canada or if you're in Japan, different prices for the same content might apply. Um, so there's a lot of exciting things people are developing, but it's still very early in terms of, you know, what's alive and available and ready to, to scale. Now, the exciting part of that is, as a filmmaker, you could jump in with a movie, and if you can figure out the right DNA of how to market it and how to get your community around it, um, and we did this with a documentary six years ago, where we did over a million dollars in sales in the first week and a half on independent documentary with no marketing budget. Was that the UFO one? That was the, yeah, yeah it was an, <laughs> an extraterrestrial conspiracy doc. Good communities with the UFO people, well, and the I, best. Yeah, and I think that that's part of it, but yeah. the point is it was, a, it was a transactional VOD release on a new platform that nobody had used before, and we were able to figure out a way to use the technology they had built to roll out a very successful distribution that we were running ourselves. There was no studio, there was no, you know, big push from anyone else. So I think for filmmakers, looking at the technology that some of these companies are building and identifying, is there a way that you can, you know, because ultimately it's you still that's gonna be the one that cares the most about the success of your film. So is there a way you can utilize, you know, the tech that they're building uh, to make your film a success? Thank you. There was another question over here, and here comes the mic to you. Well, I present one of those companies that are live. Uh, it's um, uh, Cinema Welcome. That's the name of the company. Uh, we uh, made the whole production. Uh, we made a premiere at Cannes Film Festival. It's a social network of online cinemas, social network, uh, empowered by blockchain. So as a producer, you can set up a price to your movie and uh, uh, get unlimited amount of viewers at one place at the same time, have any... Um, uh, time slots you prefer and uh, monetize your content since it's blockchain it's transparent secure and you monetize your content right away you get and could you just repeat the name of the company cinema welcome so I have the cap. ah there we go <laughs> it's all cinema in the cap. Welcome. 
Nice. Yeah, please check it out. It's live now. Make blockchain great again. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Another question. Hello, my question is for JD. Um, I'm coming in as a novice. My, I learned about cryptocurrencies from my son who bought Bitcoin when they were less than $100 when he was 15. So I know it's a thing and I know it's something to concentrate on. I have a couple of questions. One is, uh, you, who determines the value of the token as the film progresses down its path towards uh, eventual screening and sale? And secondly, you talked about early liquidity. Now, I'm assuming this is some sort of an exit strategy for your investors. Do the investors then exit to another peer-to-peer -peer transaction, or can they actually cash out at that point? Well, good, good on your son for getting into Bitcoin at under $100. Yeah. <laughs> um, there's, in terms of the value, that will be determined by the secondary market. So it's really about, just like any secondary market, supply and demand. Um, and the security token platforms are still relatively new, so how that pricing of that is driven you know, we're still tweaking and working out. There'll be a price that's set in the, in the private sale, in the, which is happening already, the price is set, in the public pre-sale and the crowd sale. Um, so as, you know, the hope is as that goes up, the people who are investing now early in the private sale will, you know, reap the benefit of kind of taking the early risk, so to speak. Um, yes, they will be able to cash out when they, you know, they unload their tokens on a security token exchange. Now. Some of those exchanges might have the ability to diversify their interest in our film into another security token or into another uh, cryptocurrency. And through those platforms, um, they'll be able to, if they choose, liquidate, um, you know, liquidate for fiat currencies. I would imagine that would then be wired directly to their specific account. So, and that's different than when token holders actually receive a distribution uh, from a collection account. So basically, we set it up as a Wyoming corporation because in the US, the White Wyoming is kind of on the forefront of uh, passing friendly uh, blockchain regulations. I read, and Just like it, in Europe, it's, it's uh, Switzerland, right? Well, in Europe, you have Switzerland, Malta, Gibraltar. Oh, there's a few places. Days. I mean, and honestly, there's a number of jurisdictions that are stepping up. In the Caribbean, there's some great ones. There's Bermuda, um, you know, a few, a few others that um, are doing great stuff. But in the US, for a security token, we could do it because there's existing regulation that already we can use um, to go to market. But uh, we did set up a Wyoming corporations. People are buying shares in those in that corporation. Those shares are digitized and then put, you know, uh, tokenized and put on the Ethereum blockchain so that depending on your jurisdiction or if you're accredited investor in the U.S., you have to wait for 12 months. If you're uh, not U.S., you're Reg S., you know, international investor, you can, you can do it sooner, somewhere in the neighborhood of four months. But it's also partially driven by where what is the real liquidity of the secondary markets, which that's still new. So part of the reason we've waited as long as we have is there's only, I think, one or two security token exchanges that are even live with ATS licenses right now. So, and that's a license to be able to essentially be the intermediary for that transaction that you're talking about. Um, there's T0, which is another big one that's raised a ton of money that should be coming live uh, very soon. So I, there, are, there will be those markets there, but you know, point being, I would say it's probably at least towards the end of this year, or early next year, until there's, we'll have a good sense of what is the traction or what is the liquidity in those markets. I know that in talking to people in the crypto space, everybody's excited and looking at security tokens as like the next wave, um, you know, where we could see a big, you know, big boost in, in economic activity, kind of like we saw with ICOs. So, um, yeah. Good. Thank Hopefully you. that answers your question. Any other questions? Yes, down here. Microphone coming to you on your left. Thank you. Um, are you, specifically to JD, are you concerned at all about the action on the secondary market of your ability to set a price uh, for further offerings? Is that a concern at all or is there no? Set a price for further offerings. So uh, it seems as though you're gradually releasing tokens. I don't know what the terminology is, but if there's, you know, some actor on the secondary market that wants to make a play for whatever, you know, return, and that drives a price up or down, and you might not have a control over that, is that a concern of yours or not? Well, it's something that you have to strategically look at, like what are the token tokenomics, as they call it, of, and a security token, it's a little different than utility tokens. Um, in some ways simpler, but it's still similar considerations. So we're doing a private sale where the, the price is set, 
public pre-sale, this price is set, and there's no secondary market. In the crowd sale, there will be there will be some dynamic qualities to to the price, and we're, our hope is is that it will, because if we've done a good job, the demand will be high, and therefore it will drive price in the direction we want it to go in. So I think there's things that just like, look, there's no. When I jumped out and decided to do this, there was a number of studios that wanted to fund this movie when we got it out of Paramount that offered to buy it from us. And I had already gone pretty deep down the rabbit hole of committing that I was passionate about blockchain and wanted to demonstrate with this big movie that we're doing with DiCaprio's company that this is a viable way for filmmakers to do this. Um, so there's no guarantees that, you know, that we're not going to you know, knock our head or skin our knee or make some mistakes along the way. I mean, we definitely will. But as entrepreneurs, you do your best to just create a strategy so that, um, you know, that we get the results or the outcome we're looking for. And I think that when we get the community engaged, like once we get to the crowd sale stage where you have 2.7 billion gamers around the world and Atari fans are like so passionate about the brand because that was their thing, you know, as much as I'm, I'm more of like a Nintendo guy because I'm a little <laughs> young for Atari, but for Atari fans, that, that was their, they're so passionate about it. So when we get that community going around the project, which hasn't even happened yet, I'm confident that the secondary market will be will be strong in terms of the value going the right direction. So, Manuel, uh, yeah, I just wanted to add uh, the conversation that uh, detail uh, related to a conversation that we had a few weeks ago, and uh, you were explaining to me that, um, well, you are in the process of casting right now, so the cast has an impact on the budget, but it also has an impact on your uh, success in terms of uh, attracting investors, in fact, which is interesting because you, 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 there, there is a double strategy in a way. You, you, it's the chicken and the egg, you know, you, you, you have to, um, well, just to say that, to, to, return, to return back to, to, the, to the question of tokenization, you know, it's important to, to see that financing strategy is very, uh, it's integrated with the, the marketing strategy and, and your capacity to, to attract investors will be related to the to the to capacity to, to, to have a good casting and then uh, so maybe you could um, explain more about this. Well, no, and I think the hope is is that we can actually decouple those variables to a degree because that's I'm mean, sure as producers or filmmakers in the room will attest it's one of the great frustrations of being a filmmaker is if you constantly feel like there's obstacles that are put in front of you that keep you from just creating your vision. I mean, my hope is is that there's new models and systems that would be built so filmmakers will be able to focus on expressing the divine creative vision they have for their movie or their TV series or whatever it is. In our case, because of the level of the budget, as a producer who has the fiduciary responsibility to be smart, I'm, you know, even though our investors are not demanding that, oh, you have to have Tom Cruise or we're not giving you the money. It's not like that. But at the same time, I'm trying to be mindful of, you know, as any producer or any businessman should, how do we make good decisions that are going to put the project in the best chances to succeed. So, and I, the best position to succeed. So, I, we're definitely cast. For us, there's marketability considerations, of course, and, we're, and there's a number of A-list people that are reading the script, and we're we're engaged with around possibly, you know, acting in the film. But to be honest, the creative considerations are being held on equal par with, you know, this guy, you know, just did Jurassic World, or this guy just did this big movie, and so, you know, we're doing our best to kind of put those more on an even footing, whereas a studio might say, you know, this is our formula, this is, you know, this guy did X amount in this country, so that's why we're picking him. We're going to pick the people that are the best cast for the movie that also, you know, take, while well, taking into consideration that market value. So, I, but I think these systems could decouple that chicken and the egg or could actually change that, and I think that's one of the great, you know, potential outcomes that could happen if, if entrepreneurs are building the platforms, you know, like Zach and others, can do so in a way that you know creates a new model, because because when community can drive it, when community can invest and say we're going to put the money in because we believe in this filmmaker, we believe in this idea, we believe in this project, it changes those dynamics. All of a sudden, the actor and I'm not to say actors are important, but the power that they have to say, well, we're we're going to be the ones that decide, or agents saying we're the ones that are going to decide whether a film gets made or not. To me, you know, they're they're some of the intermediaries that need to be, uh, you know, put in check to some extent. Okay, we have time for one more question back here. Uh, mostly a question for Zach, but I would love to hear anybody else's opinion on it. Uh, what do you think is the minimum threshold for budgets? Uh, 
for films to be able to use blockchain to track distribution worldwide. Uh, is there a, a threshold that you have to clear, you know, for smaller budget films? Uh, and on the distribution side, on, for distributors, is there any kind of carrot for them to play ball with uh, using blockchain? Because they could just come back and say, like, no, mm -hmm. we're not doing that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Um, in theory, no, for the minimum budget. Where I, I think the real benefit, I think all of us have talked about this, the, the, the potential of this technology is for the smaller independent films and producers that don't have a billion dollar law firm that's standing behind them that can then go fight for their intellectual property and try to you know, fight every step of the way in order to um, make sure that their intellectual property and the distribution rights are all being, there's all compliance and, and everything. Uh, but it also depends on the platform that they're using it. If they wanna build their own platform, that cost is extremely high, but depending on, if you're looking at, let's say, Slate that has their own internal cryptocurrency in it, um, which I don't know too much about, um, then you can, like, that's depending on their pricing model. And then, like, for ours, which our company is called Featurely, um, we have no internal cryptocurrency, no internal um, valuation token. Um, so the payments are, uh, the cost is basically the cost that would be to interact with individuals at the moment. Um, and whatever it would cost in, uh, that's set by usually the, the consortium that runs enterprise blockchains. I think that's another important distinction to make that cryptocurrencies are not just blockchain and public blockchains are different than private blockchains. And enterprise blockchains are basically like, a big group together connected by a legal contract, except for they have a computer now that enforces it. And so that cost is really dictated about the community in which it's built around. And if it's a, um, a group of producers or companies come together to try to build this system, that cost is different than, let's say you go onto a public that might have an ether price, gas price, or transaction price that you have to deal with and, and figure out. So trying to factor all of those in really gets an idea of what's it gonna cost, but then also what's your opportunity cost of you know, not using a easier, maybe a, a cheaper or more expensive off the bat technology, but I don't have to run a, and find people to make sure I'm getting paid to make sure I can meet my costs and that I'm not getting taken to court all over my different contracts. Um, is all costs that you kind of have to take into account. I think the threshold's quite low based on all of these projects, based on what pricing models work on most of these projects on an individual base. Um, but again, as Jay said, it's very new, so these, co these costs are changing quite a bit and also depends on the underlying blockchain. We're on one called Hyperledger Fabric. Um, there's also Ethereum and all these different ones. And then, yeah, so that's really the, the minimum threshold. And your second part of your question? What? Oh yeah, for distributors, yeah. So that is a big, that's a big uh, question. And it's also a big question we have with big enterprises on why would I use blockchain if that's supposed to bring transparency when I make a lot of my money on the opaqueness of the current economic system. And in the, in the way that a lot of these systems work, there's really built on consumer growth and where we see in the, in the distribution carrot comes from uh, the IP holder that if I have a really awesome film and they want distributors, want to distribute my film, then I force them to use it. Or we connect with other systems on outside the distributors to force the distributors to play. Because at the moment, there's really not a lot on the incentive side of these systems in the same way that Walmart for a supply chain would use this rather than people who are consuming it or at the, the end source or the beginning source in order to only deal with people that, that uh, use these systems. Uh, so for the IP holder, it, this is more towards, like if I'm the film owner for a bigger film, so it's a film like, let's say Atari, that a lot of people want to use, that a lot of people, distributors want to distribute, but then forcing them to, to use the system. Um, on the consumer side, uh, for the end, or end 
users like Netflix or whatever using their money to force companies in the same way that consumers are forcing uh, companies to disclose ESG reporting and you know uh, anti-slavery sides uh, to really try to force the whole chain to get on board and if you don't come on board then you can't be in, you can't be within our our system uh, is really the economic kind of right now which may not be sustainable but they're growing and I don't know enough projects to really make a data point prediction on how it's going to go. Okay, thank you. And we're a little bit over time. Thank Sorry. you, everybody. And like I said, all blockchain pioneers and our wonderful panelists. Thank you. Thank you so much. And we'll see you again at 3 o'clock to hear from Aaron Burry about...